I will just uh, take a, a minute here to welcome you all to our virtual meeting. Um, this is the, the Committee for the Decadal Survey of Ocean Sciences for the National Science Foundation. Um, this is the second decadal survey that we've done. And again, I don't see any new faces online. So um, we all are familiar with the statement of task um, and, uh, and the process. Um, so I think we can go ahead and, and jump into our panel. Um, so uh, committee members Mona Bell and Brad DeYoung are moderating this panel. Um, Mona, I'm going to hand it over to you. Fabulous. Thank you so much, Kelly. Greetings, everyone. We have an exciting panel today. This panel is going to focus on coupled ocean atmosphere research and development needs to advance modeling and prediction of the ocean on scales of societal importance, all the way from the coast to the climate. Uh, each panelist today will provide a 10-minute presentation on uh, the highest uh, priority research and infrastructure needs, and we'll follow it up with a Q&A with the committee members. So it's my pleasure and honor uh, to welcome our panelists today. We have Dr. Eric Chazanay from uh, Florida State University, Dr. Shui Chen from University of Washington, Dr. Sarah Gillet. Uh, did I say that name right, your last name right? Gilly. Gilly from Scripps Institute of Oceanography and Dr. Galen McKinley from Columbia University. Welcome panelists, I'll turn it over to you to make your opening remarks. And I believe we will begin with Dr. Chazanay. So can you share the screen or what, should, what do you expect from me at this point? Sure thing. You're welcome to share the screen. You should, uh, Kelly, Zoe, is share screen enabled? No, it's not. It mm -hmm. should be, yes. Now it is. Okay. okay, thank you. All right, so we've been asked, you know, to address what you think is the most urgent high priority scientific question in the field. And I've decided to focus on uh, one aspect that is close to my heart, which is the ocean net, net current feedback on the atmosphere, and especially the impact on the ocean prediction. So, <clears throat> current state of the art for ocean prediction is um, a routine, systems that are run ocean only with prescribed atmosphere provide forecasts for the next uh, week to two weeks at the most. There's the European system, Ecuador, the <clears throat> high calm gulfs at uh, Navy, the Blue Link in uh, Australia, and you also have another high calm base at NOAA. What I would say state of the art is probably the Navy uh, ESPC couple system at 125th degree, which is about three kilometers. And um, then what we have is, so all those are fairly short integration with data simulation. You do have decayed on climate integration of a coupled ocean ice atmosphere of a, with a resolution about one tenth of a degree, which is about eight kilometers at the equator. And more recently, there have been some prototypes, the global and basin scale on the what I call kilometer scale models with tides. Talk about the MIT GCM uh, globally, the NEMO code, the French code, the HICOM, ROMS, and so on. So the impact in general of increased resolution in couple system has been well documented and um, that really reduces the bias. One aspect I'd like to uh, emphasize is the fact, at least for the ocean, the, the ocean current, current feedback on the atmosphere really corrects some bias by providing a needed energy sink mechanism, the so-called eddy killing effect. And, but one statement I'd like to make, it really is, strongly dependent on the horizontal grid spacing that the numerical model is using. So here is an example from a publication about four or five years ago, where you, on the top, you have two um, 
any kinetic energy observations, uh, either from satellites or from uh, drifters. And at the bottom, we have two simulation. And it doesn't really matter which model it is, but the main point is on the left, the simulation use absolute wind, meaning that the ocean current is assumed to be zero and the st wind stress is uh, computed from the um, atmospheric winds only. On the right is something that's a little more realistic where you actually take the <coughs> ocean current and compute the stress uh, by looking at the difference between the wind velocity and the ocean current. And the main point is that if you, two things. So first one is that the, uh, in the case of rotative wind, you can see that the eddy kinetic energy inside the domain pretty much everywhere is wiped out. This is what we call the eddy killing effect. The fact that you use rotative winds really removes a lot of the variability. On the left, with the absolute wind, you see that they are closer, but still weaker than the observation. And let me state that those are what we call high resolution, which is one tenth of a degree overall. But one thing that is really significant is that there's a bias that's removed. In the case with the absolute winds, you can see that you have eddies that are formed, the agarose current eddies form, and there's a train of them that are pretty much steady that creates this band of eddy kinetic energy on the left, which is corrected when you use rotative winds. So oceanic current feedback is essential for the proper simulation of it. But like I mentioned, is that they are a bit too coarse and uh, you know using just straight relative wind um, is too strong, even if you parameterize the current feedback like you never was suggested. So, but as you go up in horizontal resolution and go to the kilometer scale, then you start to have more energy in the model and uh, the eddy killing effect is actually needed to obtain realistic level of surface eddy energy. So here is an example for the Gulf of Mexico. On the top row, you see the absolute wind, so no current feedback, no relative wind. And as you increase resolution from eight kilometer to one kilometer, you start to see a lot more eddy kinetic energy and on the right here is a reference of the observation. So at eight kilometer, you start to have a good agreement, but then as you get up in horizontal resolution, the eddy kinetic energy starts to become much larger than the observation. This is where you need to add dissipation and dissipation is provided by the current feedback. But if you use a relative wind, which is the bottom one, it is too strong. You really, there is no eddy, the eddies that they are forming the loop current from eddies that move westward, they all dissipate too fast, even at one kilometer. When you parameterize the ocean current feedback by using the 70% of the uh, ocean current, you start to see that the one kilometer high resolution is in good agreement with the observation. So that's parameterized. There is a recent work by Laranega et al. that they did the same amount uh, same investigation, but they used a couple system. In the case of uh, no CF in here, it's called the no current feedback. And if you look at the, without the uh, current feedback, you have excessive kinetic, any kinetic energy in the loop current itself. And, um, and as well as the westward, the same as the result that just presented in the previous slides. But when you include the coupled feedback in the coupled system, this is coupled ocean atmosphere system, you start to see that the uh, eddy kinetic energy is closer to the observation. The other thing it does, it the average penetration of the loop current is shorter in the case of no current feedback, but also gets closer to the observation, which is the dash line, when you the current feedback. So all those points are just to you know make stress how important that uh, air-sea interaction takes place, especially for the ocean model. So here is the uh, emphasis on the position of the loop current. So now um, 
most of the models use one tenth of a degree. That's eight kilometer at the equator, about six kilometer mid latitude. Here is a work done a few years ago where we went from one twelfth degree, which is kind of the norm for ocean prediction system. And what you have is a very short penetration of the Gulf Stream, no radioactivity. One twenty fifth degree is not that much better, but it's only when you go to one fiftieth degree, which is about a kilometer scale, you start to have a reasonable comparison of the observation, except for excessive uh, eddy kinetic energy at the surface here. So and this emphasizes that at one kilometer, around one kilometer, the penetration of the energy in the interior is actually realized. And when you compare to the observation, what the other ones are, of course, to actually represent the variability in the interior of the ocean. However, you know, it's still, you know, a discrepancy between the uh, satellite measured where you see the variability is mostly confined along the main axis of the jet, and you have a very strong variability here uh, around the region of New England, the CNAM. The thing is, we did a conversion study, so the bathymetry in the simulation at 110, 125th, and 150th were all fairly coarse using six kilometer. When you use a correct uh, bathymetry for the grid spacing, you see a huge difference. And uh, then it closely, more closely resemble the observations. And, um, and all this were very small difference in bathymetry. So this really illustrate how important bathymetry representation at the fine resolution is. And that was published uh, last uh, summer. But, um, <clears throat> there is a still a um, another discrepancy. Still, you still have too much energy in the uh, in the Gaussian extension here when you compare to the observation. And all the runs I talked about were using the absolute wind. Once you start to use a uh, relative wind at seventy percent, including the atmospheric feedback, you start to see again a significant improvement in it. So all this to emphasize that kilometer scale models as well as ocean atmospheric feedback is required. So to conclude a few observations, um, there is no clear mandate by the various agencies on how to further investigate the ocean current feedback on the atmosphere and its impact on the ocean prediction. And overall, there are some competing interests and duplication of, uh, of efforts. I mean, at NOAA, you really don't have a lot, NOAA high resolution composition atmospheric model system. And it's clearly upstaged by the European, especially at CMWF and the Met Office that have high res MEP at uh, one tenth of a degree. NASA has um, pushed the envelope by uh, using uh, currently a prototype 125th degree ocean and uh, 116th degree atmosphere, but it's very expensive when they have simulation, when they're computer time on about 8,000 cores. ONR is doing ocean prediction on a coupled system at 125th degree and 18 kilometers in the atmosphere, but it's mostly only geared toward uh, prediction and there's not a lot of investigation of the free run without the investigation. At the NCAR and SF, you have a one tenth degree and a quarter degree in this one. So there is no real US concerted effort to push kilometer scale ocean atmospheric models. So recommendations would be to sponsor a community effort to perform a couple kilometer scale ocean atmospheric nature run to better understand the feedback this is a major enterprise that would take five to you know five to ten years from good five years to put in place, get community endorsement, and actually perform. Such a major run would be used to improve multi-scale data simulation as well as uh, designing observing systems. And finally, a plug a little bit for something that uh, was a colleague of mine, Eric Bailey at NOAA. We put together OceanPredict.us, which is an effort designed to coalesce the, um, you know, the various operational oceanography, NOAA and ONR, NASA, what everybody's doing. It's very different than what's happening in Europe 
where the European Copernicus is very well coordinated and uh, provides a product that is easily accessible to the community. So I just, uh, here's a web page, oceanpedic.us, you can go and have more information of what we're trying to do here. So that's it. All right. Uh, Fabulous. Thank you so much, Eric. That was very helpful. Uh, Shui, you're next. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Good. Uh, display mode. Okay. Well, thank you for the opportunity. Um, so my 10 minutes ish will be focused on observing the coupled ocean atmosphere for advanced uh, earth system science. So I have um, put some of the uh, uh, points that I like to make at the beginning to address this multi-scale ocean atmosphere interaction that play a critical role in global weather and climate continuum. So in this talk, I will talk a bit about the extreme weather events that actually in this multi-scale uh, realm and to the sub-seasonal to seasonal scale that MGO marine heat wave and how that actually go up to climate variability like ENSO and the climate change. So the question is, um, air seeks change. Now, really, it's not the traditional way of thinking just through air sea fluxes. So in fact, ocean atmosphere exchange energy mass and the momentum are influenced not only by the air sea interface, but also the upper ocean and the atmosphere boundary layer known as the air sea transition zone. So keep that in mind. I'll go through a few examples to show you why do we need to go all the way to observe that transition zone. So let's see if I can, yeah. So. The next thing is, what is the air sea transition zone as it defined? So the uh, pretty much put all together in terms of upper ocean interface and atmosphere boundary layer, we call the whole area of air sea transition zone. You can put a lot of physical process. This is by Chi Dong Zhang in a paper recently published. Uh, describe the system that not only ocean surface, but it interacting with fresh water, salinity and uh, all the shear in the atmosphere, in the ocean, and so on, so on. Even though they interact locally sometimes, but they actually have a different time scale. This is when the weather meet the climate. So in fact, the transition from the higher frequency to low frequency can be shown in the next few examples I will um, talk about. But I do think this is very exciting that we can now have technology and things to observe these all together. So um, it is not something we dream it up just now, but it has a long history been thinking about. Start with hurricane uh, fuel campaigns, even 20 years ago now, sea blast was organized by um, ONAR, Navy, and NOAA. So we had a multiple uh, aircraft observations really tend to observe. This is a sea blast that observe uh, all atmosphere side and surface. So the question, the time on the upper ocean as well. So the question at time is how surface waves affect uh, air sea fluxes because surface, ocean surface in the high wind regime is not a standstill. It's very dynamic. I'll show you a second. Um, the other one, uh, led by the ONLAR is over the West Pacific, deal with how the ARPA ocean uh, tea, tropical cyclone induced the cold wave can in turn influence tropical intensity and forecasting the uh, hurricane structures. So fast forward with this, uh, because we so far having hard time to actually putting things into the uh, in situ at ocean surface. So many of you have seen this YouTube video, and in fact, for a while, was on the uh, the most watched weather and climate videos ever produced. This is what ocean surface looks like 
by a sildrum inside of the storm. So that pointing you to the new technology that uncooled platform, adding a huge capability for us now to address this problem in its totality. Ocean surface is not standstill. In fact, sometimes sojourn sees it as a vertical. So you can get to uh, over 100 feet height in terms of uh, uh, ocean surface waves. So uh, having this in mind, I want to give you a few more examples how these can actually upscaling um, to a much larger scale. So this is a few campaign conducted in Indian Ocean 2011-12. We flew aircraft, uh, P3, NOAA P3, and this was a joint program with NSF, Navy, and the DOD, DOE and DOD. Um, we did a drop airdrop sounds, drop sounds, and ocean sounds. Try to map out cross ocean, very large scale basin, to map out the way so you can focus just to the left two panels. And that is the air atmosphere boundary layer and the upper ocean. And then you can tell the different regime with very low winds versus very high winds and over a few weeks apart. We can describe them in much more details when we actually put them all together. But again, that's just the uh, one field campaigns. So fast forward even further, I want to use this one example to demonstrate why this sort of a global implication of multi-scale things matter, matter to um, high impact extreme weather. So this is not very too distant. I don't know, um, maybe Sarah is from Southern California. Still remember February this year, we had a thousand year flood in LA County. And uh, the top two shows the precipitation and the flooding potential and actually flood on the ground. This event was no accident. It was actually have so many players lined up that we do have middle of a new and very strong MGO mandan Julian oscillation. Like I mentioned, we observe them in the Indian Ocean and the atmosphere river connecting to these things and the jet in the unusual location. All these things led to this uh, event. And this took many months to build up to this. So air interaction in this multi-skill fashion matters a lot. Just quickly, um, you may or may not remember, we started 2023 as a La Nina state uh, in January, this top panel, if you look at the right uh, side. And then, then a few months later, we went through the neutral state and only two to three months later, we got full blown on Nino. See, these kind of things very happens in much faster time scale than we used to think. And this happened to be MGO induces these. MGO is on the sub-seasonal scale. They can induce warming in the West Pacific, the Central Pacific, that influence onside of ENSO. So given that, I want you to keep this in mind, our model has a certain scale, but definitely not onside of the event. This is the forecast made in September, 2022. And the real observed event is this red curve. When you actually switch from La Nina state to El Nino, you can go extremely fast. Um, I mean, extremely, like a few months. Um, most model cannot get to this, in fact, Majority model forecast actually forecast neutral state, uh, but observed one by the time you get to this state is much, much stronger, much faster. So to put it all together, so this diagram is take a little explanation here. So the top panel shows you the warm pool, the El Nino, La Nino really kind of translate to how the change of sea surface temperature in the Pacific. So the way I plot this is that the color representing time, so over six months in January, 2020. And then the, uh, the contours are the warm pool. The warm pool is represented by 28 and a half degrees Celsius. 
So basically, in time, that establish of this El Nino Nino three box is actually by moving the warm pool from West Pacific toward the Central Pacific. Although you do have independent warming on the other side, but this East Miss West is the one that are getting you the ENSO onset. During this time, if you follow the lower panel in time, this rapid switch from La Nina to El Nino within several months is actually pushed by three very major MGO event. That upscaling effect is very clear, but our model can't really do this currently. Um, to summarize this quickly, just give you a sense of how these multi-scale in mechanism works. So in first, you have MGO dump a lot of rain on the ocean surface and a strong westerly east. And then in the East Pacific is a strong trade wind. Once the rain dumped into the ocean, it created a huge amount of fresh water pool and it generated a active density current in the ocean. This time, the ocean takes over in the next several weeks actually moving this warm pool by having a very large scale ocean density current against the surface wind. This is a really important one to keep in mind. This kind of a coupling change our per ocean stratification barrier layer. There are a whole lot of dynamic going on. We usually have hard time to observe water against the winds, have a huge amount of importance to final state, which is the uh, upstate to the ensole state. And at that time, when you move the water toward central East Pacific, you can relax treat wind. And this process is truly multi-scale. You start from a shorter time scale, upgrading, uh, upscaling this in the next several weeks by ocean itself, even though the wind from MGO is already uh, subsided. And then eventually, wind respond to the SSD gradient. That takes months to do, right? So I want to leave you with some thoughts about opportunities that uh, NSF can have in terms of supporting this tropical um, observing in terms of an air-sea uh, interface zone. This map shows you some of the past attempt. So I was involved in Dynamo, Togo Core, and then Atlantic but right now, there is really strong interest and a need to observe Central Pacific. There's a planned fuel campaign called East Pac, uh, Tropical East uh, Tropical uh, Equatorial Pacific Experiment. And then we have um, many planned, this is for 2026-27, and we have a multiple uh, instruments uh, put in place and try to get the ship and all the uh, moorings together to observe. This is a traditional way to set up ocean observing array, but this is what we're having currently. We have many amend crews. And this is sort of vendor line. We are actually incorporating many of these observing uh, platform, including sail drones that I showed you a video of the sail drones and put them all together um, Try to see if I can advance this. Um, the NOAA has a hurricane observing program that already putting many of these uncrewed and the traditional observing things together for observing this, um, the air sea transition zone. So with that, I'm gonna leave you a few um, thoughts and maybe as recommendations to so as I said, these multi-scale phenomena in the air-sea coupled uh, space that it truly can advance Earth systems um, modeling and prediction. What we need is observations right now that lack of integrated observation of the air-sea transition zone that hinders the accuracy of Earth system modeling and prediction. So the emerging technology and crude observing platform. And the one thing I didn't have time to mention is that AI machine learning present unprecedented opportunity, both 
helping observing systems and also modeling prediction systems, this can actually uh, emerge all together, moving things forward. As for NSF, I really think NSF can tra make transform changes, first of all, by embracing the interdisciplinary research and remove some of the current barrier of its current very siloed discipline funding structures, ocean, atmosphere, hydrology, everybody funded separately, and making this very comprehensive earth system studies and a coupled air sea uh, modeling and observation difficult. Then the lastly, I do think the ASF can lead and could collaborate with NOAA, NASA, DOD, and the DOE on major national and international field campaigns, like the one example I showed you, the upcoming 2026-27 TPEX field campaign. Um, I want to leave you one thought that, uh, that about ASF. Uh, during the re recent UCAR meeting, um, UCAR board trustees, I'm also the uh, director of ASF Punch came to give us a talk and also try to gather information about what we thought. He mentioned ASF has done very big things in the past from 50s to from explore Antarctic and the 70s explore the global ocean and 80s and 90s of Togo Core that actually transformally changed how we actually thinking atmosphere coupled system and the predicting climate. But he stopped there. He will say, we haven't done big things since and we really would love to do it. So hopefully, you know, we can take his word and the intention of the NSF to heart and then moving this forward. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Shiri. That was terrific. And it builds very nicely on the comments that Eric shared with us. So next up, we have Sarah. Okay, I can share my screen. I think that's working. Okay, so hopefully you can see um, so I'm going to have comments that follow um, from what Eric and Shui have presented. Um, and I really want to talk sort of broadly about, let's see if my slides will advance. There we go. Um, the, a range of scales that matter for uh, atmosphere ocean processes. I'm going to draw a little on discussion that happened um, for Ocean OBS um, 2019. The so the community effort to really think about observing system needs. And I think, um, so this was a plot that was put together for one of the community papers for that, um, led by Megan Cronin, and it was really the product of quite a bit of community discussion at the time. Uh, it highlights the range of processes that feed into thinking about how the ocean and atmosphere talk to each other. And it extends from on one end, anthropogenic global warming, which ha happens over very large spatial scales and long time scales, and has really small net heat fluxes. So something that's hard to detect, uh, uh, but large in scale, to processes that are much more rapid and smaller scale. If um, and I'm just going to highlight the basics here. If we were only interested in the anthropogenic global warming, we would we could do that with Argo floats. I'm currently sitting at the SOCOM meeting in Princeton, New Jersey. We're talking about biogeochemical Argo floats. If that's if all we wanted to do was measure the net increase of the reservoirs into the ocean system, we would put out floats and we would see a net increase in heat and a net uh, increase in carbon in the ocean, and we'd be able to put pin down with reasonable precision, the gains or changes in the ocean over decadal timescales. But that, that perspective clearly misses a lot of what's also happening in the ocean. Um, we can get changes in heat, freshwater, pH, carbon dioxide, nutrients from profiling floats, but we're not getting the processes that feed into that. And just to illustrate that here, I'm showing 
uh, work from a paper led by Veronica Tamsett that compared two moorings in the Southern Ocean. One is the Australian mooring, the SOFS mooring, and the other is uh, an NSF mooring, the Ocean Observatories Initiative mooring, which was out for a little while. And for a period of time, they had overlapping measurements. So the time series here shows the changes in heat flux over time for four years, I guess, um, at these two mooring sites. And you can see that the annual cycles are really similar at OOI in orange and softs in blue. But what really matters, the, in fact, the only thing that matters in these is that there are really enormous short-lived events. And so if you look at what causes deepening of the mixed layer, major heat loss events at these sites, it's pretty much determined by the few largest events that happen at each site uh, and not by the annual average. And what that means is that if we really want to understand not how much heat is sequestered into the ocean, but why it's sequestered, we have to be measuring in a way where we can see short-lived events that basically come from one major storm that's bringing cold air from the Antarctic continent into this area. Uh, and that requires a really different observing system than the Argo system. So, so when we look at this whole picture, we're really concluding that the weather systems that di disrupt our lives that come from the ocean and that to capture the full range of processes, we need to probe this full range, everything from small scales to large scales. And these small scale processes will have a rectified effect on our large scale climate change. So um, out of Ocean OBS came the Observing Air-Sea Interaction Strategy Working Group, OASIS, which is co-led by Megan Cronin and Seb Swart in Sweden and uh, Krista Marandino in Kiel. And uh, um, OASIS has identified, after going through a lot of community discussion, three major themes, grand ideas. Uh, grand idea number one says, it's really important to have a globally distributed in situ air sea observing network uh, that can measure what's happening at individual sites. Grand idea, so that that's sort of, um, in situ observing network is consistent with the things that NSF does, especially through OOI and what NOAA does as a sustained observing system. Um, grand idea number three says, we need to improve models and understanding of air sea interaction processes. So really looking at process studies. And that's very much the sort of thing that we expect that NSF will support in the US. And grand idea number two um, emphasizes the importance of having, having satellites as part of this to help connect the independent observations. And that's something that NASA has taken a lead on um, uh, with a support from NOAA. I emphasized Odyssey here, which is a satellite proposal that I'm involved in as PI for NASA at the moment, and which follows directly from what Eric talked about related to oceans and currents interacting. Um, so maybe I have a slightly vested interest in, in what NASA is doing at the moment. Um, and so it's really important to think about how these all fit together. Um, part of the discussion then for Ocean Ops also said that we should think about what this in situ observing system might look like. And uh, this map was put together as part of that, showing an observing system that consists of um, major flux mooring sites marked with black squares uh, as sort of sustained obs observations. And, um, and then localized or more um, less extensive mooring sites, which are these smaller black circles covering the whole globe. And those might be viewed as uh, coming from sail drones or other uncrewed surface vehicles. Um, so this is this grand idea number one approach from OASIS really implicitly includes NOAA buoys and NSF Ocean Observatories initiative sites, as well as contributions from international partners. Um, I highlighted in pink here the OOI sites that are really obvious, the Ermier Sea, Ocean Station Papa, and this um, sadly defunct Ocean Observatories initiative site in the Southern Ocean. Um, and um, this comes with an essentially a, a wish list for infrastructure to um, 
that we might put as part of this to maintain the Argo array to capture the ocean's evolving reservoir of heat and fresh water, um, to have flex moorings. Um, and I want to highlight especially the importance of having them in the Southern Ocean. You can see there's really only since the OOI mooring is gone, there's really only one flex mooring in the Southern Ocean. Uh, and it doesn't do everything. People, Jim Edson, who runs OOI and who's not in a position to propose more, has pointed out that this OOI mooring site is the most useful mooring site he has, but he doesn't have a way to get more measurements there uh, unless somebody else proposes it. Um, and and implicit in this also is the importance of having process studies to help unravel the physics. So I think that's really a hope for what we might see. Um, and then um, when we come back to these grand ideas, uh, there's also the, the NASA component of this. And so I want to talk a little about NSF's role in potential satellite missions, thinking first about what's coming down the pipeline. So if we think about momentum fluxes, the wind current interactions that Eric talked about, there are two things really in the offing at the moment. Um, the European Space Agency is launching a multi-satellite system called Harmony in 2029. It will obtain, uh, use a SAR system with multiple satellite receivers, so three satellites flying in tandem, to look at winds and currents in very small areas. So we'll have high resolution, but postage stamp sized areas without much control over where they measure. Um, but it's an opportunity to get measurements of a type that would really fit well with the types of um, observational ideas that Eric talked about. And then, as I said, I'm the PI for the Odyssey proposal, which is a JPL and CNES, the French Space Agency, uh, initiative proposed to NASA's Earth System Explorer program. So we have moved to phase A, which means we're allowed to write a bigger proposal, which will be due in March. Um, and it's a Doppler scatterometer, which will measure winds and currents. If it's selected, it, um, it would get a 2030 or a 2032 launch date. And then there also is a lot of discussion about turbulent heat fluxes from satellite. Some things can be done with SIMR, which is a European Space Agency all weather sea surface temperature system, which will be relatively high resolution. So it'll give us better sea surface temperature and more would be done um, with a concept that um, was proposed to NASA uh, a few years ago and was not selected, but it will be reproposed, it reviewed well to provide near surface temperature and humidity as well as sea surface temperature and wind. And that was called butterfly. So, if if these types of measurements go ahead, then there's a real partnership opportunity um, that extends beyond what the space agencies can do. And I think we've seen with the SWAT satellite, uh, which launched a year and a half ago, that's the surface water and ocean topography, um, that there's been enormous success by having what's been called the Adopt a Crossover Program. It mobilized research groups across the planet, 20 or 30 of them, to carry out or observations that were coordinated with the narrow three-month time window of the satellite CalVal. Um, so that allows validation across a range of conditions. It also allows a lot of science. And I think that that's a real opportunity for NSF to think about contributing to the sort of open science, uh, hypothesis-driven questions that can happen in conjunction with a new satellite observing system, whether um, coordinated with calibration and validation, but supporting process studies or just process studies on the mo their own, as well as early adopter initiatives. So some final comments. Um, I think following very directly from what Shui said, I really wanted to emphasize the importance of multi-scale observations and analysis and how they are really needed to cover the full range of processes and the interplay between scales. And then, um, uh, part of this is also the importance of the full transition zone from the base of the mixed layer to the top of the marine atmospheric boundary layer. So I will stop there. Thank you. That's fantastic. Thank you so much, Sarah. Everyone, I dropped a link in the chat window to OASIS and another document that Sarah pointed to. And I'm going to invite Galen to uh, give us uh, her, her perspectives and wrap this panel off. 
Okay, great. Uh, thank you very much, uh, everyone, for being here and for giving me the opportunity to present about quantifying the ocean carbon cycle. I'm going to take sort of a larger scale perspective and focus on the biogeochemical uh, connections with, uh, with the ocean circulation, climate variability, as has been discussed before. So what is the ocean carbon cycle, right? The ocean carbon cycle, as we understand it now, is a combination of a natural cycle that is quantitatively dominant, that includes both the biological component and the large scale circulation of the ocean. And on top of that, we are imposing this anthropogenic uh, modification that is essentially Henry's law operating at the global scale, um, adding carbon to the headspace above the water and driving it into the ocean. But our conceptual model of quantifying how much carbon the ocean is taking up is really built upon this, uh, this diagram here. This is, of course, a global mean perspective, right? It gives you sort of global mean profiles from observations and a large scale view of the kinds of processes. But in fact, we all well know that the, the real ocean uh, is, is uh, something entirely different, right? So this is from the uh, Echo Darwin model. It's a simulation of air sea CO2 fluxes with blue being into the ocean, red being out. Um, and the winds uh, shown here are, are in the gray vectors. And you can see the very high frequency variation that's occurring as well as the large scale latitudinal distribution of the fluxes. Um, so this is as, as, is, as has been shown in the previous talks, as with all things oceanographic, you know, very difficult to observe, highly variable across multiple spatial scales, spatial temporal scales. But what we know is that these fluxes add up to a significant climate service, right? If we add up these fluxes, integrate them um, over the whole globe and compare them to the fossil emissions, we know that the ocean cumulatively since 1850 has taken up about 37% of all of our fossil emissions. With the land use and land sink being approximately equal, only the ocean is a net sink of carbon from the atmosphere, uh, and so is really critical to mitigating climate change. And we know that this is going to continue to occur in the future. And so really understanding the future of climate change is strongly dependent on our ability to understand the ocean carbon sink. How do we quantify the ocean carbon sink? And this is something that I would say our oceanographic community has done a great job on in the last several decades at integrating these three key approaches and coming to a level of agreement that I think is consistent with um, what um, Sarah said about this very long time scale. If all we cared about was sort of the, the large scale accumulation of carbon in the ocean, we know how to get that. But I think as I'll try to make the case to you, we really need to know this a lot better than we do right now. So the three methods are uh, interior observations taken from hydrography. From this, we can take you know, multiple um, uh, tracers in the ocean and from this back out how much additional carbon is in the ocean due to human activities. Uh, this gives us decadal closure of the global budget um, and uh, is important for model validation. Uh, but of course, because it's hydrography, we can only get a global estimate approximately decadally. So if we want higher frequencies, we need models. And the models also give us, of course, uh, the capacity to do what if studies, ask questions about mechanisms, and to make projections for the future. Um, we'll never observe the future, as everybody here knows well. In, in the last decade or so, we've added to this suite of approaches also the ability to take relatively sparse surface ocean PCO2 data compiled into the um, SOCAT uh, database by a um, a really great group of um, largely volunteers. Um, and using machine learning, we can build full field reconstructions of those um, uh, of the global PCO2 field at approximately monthly resolution, and then use machine learning. Uh, you're doing, doing that with machine learning, and then we can estimate the fluxes from that. So how well do these approaches now agree? Um, that's shown on this plot here. These are the estimates in the global carbon budget with one sigma spread on each of the individual approaches. The models are in green, the products are in blue, and these decadal uh, interior estimates are shown in orange. Um, and uh, you can see that, you know, it's the first order uh, from that sort of large scale 100 year perspective, we get a pretty good correlation here, right? And actually the green and the blue solid lines are highly correlated with each other. Um, and, and also the, the yellow estimates from the interior uh, are, are pretty close, um, particularly in the um, uh, late uh, 90s, early 2000s, a little less so for the comparison to the models 
in the more recent decade, but still we get to do a pretty good job. But still the total spread across uh, the methods, for example, for the most recent year, 2022, is still quite large. It's still about 30% of the mean flux. Um, and um, and this, this is, uh, is, is something that we need to work on um, for uh, some very key reasons. Um, so one of the key reasons is that these uh, uncertainties hamper the potential for carbon cycle science to directly contribute to the mitigation effort. In 2017, we wrote this paper where we compared from the global carbon budget, the observed atmospheric CO2 growth rate and the reconstructed growth rate based on emissions minus the land sink minus the ocean. Um, while you can see that that gray and black line are you know, look pretty good uh, in terms of their correlation. Of course, they are highly correlated. There's still some significant differences among them with the standard deviation of that difference being three gigatons of CO2 per year. If we propagate that forward at one sigma or at two sigma, we and then compare that to what would happen to these trajectories if we had um, a 0% per year cut in emissions or a negative 1% per year cut in emissions. You can see that it would take many years for us to detect um, and be able to say that yes, those cuts in emissions made a difference in the atmosphere, right? We're gonna be telling the people of the world, well, give us five years, give us a decade, and we'll tell you if you, those cuts you've been making have been making a difference. That time scale, that long tail of our ability to really detect change in the, ocean, in the um, global carbon cycle, is not well matched with the Paris Agreement that requires a five-year, um, uh, you know, a recommitment to cuts. And so we need to cut the uncertainties here, particularly in the land sink and in the ocean sink, in order to um, make ourselves better able to really say, yes, we can see those cuts uh, due to uh, due to mitigation. We can tell you that those cuts have made a difference. And I think that's a really important uh, societal service that uh, our science needs to provide. Uh, the other thing I want to note, those were global estimates um, uh, um, of, the, uh, of the sink. And now if we just look uh, spatially resolved at one degree resolution for a particular month, here we have uh, just a kind of comparison in four images of uh, two different products and two different models. And the local differences in these are massive and are at the same scale as the long-term mean fluxes, right? So though we can close the global budget, uh, locally, we have much, much higher uncertainties. Um, and so as we want to go down to regional carbon, um, uh, you know, um, um, really understanding the processes that are driving this in detail, uh, really understanding, for example, the potential to be a baseline for marine carbon dioxide removal is really going to be challenged here. So um, we're hiding a lot of our uncertainties, basically, by averaging it globally. And if all we cared about was the global, maybe that's sufficient. We have to decide how good we have to get. Uh, but there's a lot of um, uh, promises, I think, being made at these higher resolutions uh, that we're not ready to, um, to, um, to meet. Also, we know the ocean sink is expected to change significantly in the future. Uh, this is uh, just looking at CMIP-6, um, a variety of models um, where we could see that to first order, the ocean sink is going to parallel the emissions trajectories. If emissions go high, the ocean sink will grow. If emissions go low, the ocean sink will come down. Um, uh, there remains spread among these estimates, which uh, we attribute here a lot to the mean state uncertainty in uh, the, the current models. Um, but also, of course, these predictions about the future of the ocean carbon sink can be no better than our mechanistic understanding of how particularly the natural carbon cycle responds to climate change. The majority of the change that we're seeing here is simply the change in Henry's law and a kind of a first order steady state circulation, no change in ocean biology to first order, and we can get uh, kind of consistent estimates. But of course, there's so much uncertainty in the biological pump and in our circulation. So uh, because right now, as I said before, our model for the ocean carbon sink is really just the right-hand side changing. And we assume that the left-hand side is essentially constant with climate with climate to date. Uh, and I think we have good evidence that that won't be the case in the future. So just looking at circulation examples here, we are beginning to see how variable circulation, such as the rapid array, the hydro hydrographic estimates that are made at high frequency um, can be coupled with much lower frequency estimates of the anthropogenic carbon content. And we can estimate how these two interplay. 
Um, this is you know, one estimate. There's a lot of uncertainties here. But even here, we see a compensation between changing anthropogenic carbon content in the ocean and changing circulation. Um, so in order to really understand the mechanisms, we need to break apart those, um, those, uh, those compensating processes, uh, be able to model them with greater fidelity, uh, and be able to, to make better projections. I think the biological carbon pump, which is certainly not the area that I focus on personally, but is a really important area of uncertainty. So our current estimates of uh, the, the, just the mean biological uh, transfer of carbon to depth are between five and 12 plus petagrams of carbon per year. So, you know, order one uh, spread in those estimates. We know there's a huge suite of processes involved, um, uh, but we're not really able to constrain them based on our observations, process studies, and satellite observations. The divergence in the satellite, pro uh, just the NPP products from satellite is really nicely illustrated in the middle panel here, just wide variation, what that is. And of course, as I said before, if we don't understand what's going on now, uh, we're not going to be able to make good future projections. Um, this is under a moderate emission scenario, showing that the change in export production across several different models is either basically zero or, you know, something like 10 to 15 percent uh, or even greater decline. Um, the, the model's all over the place. But of course, if we do change the export production by one and a half petagrams of carbon per year, if it goes down, that means that the ocean carbon sink is gonna decline by one and a half petagrams of carbon per year, essentially. And so we really need to, um, to better constrain this. So, um, and then last point is NCDR. You know, that's really coming out as an, an interest across the federal government um, and a lot of uh, investment in that. Um, and, you know, ideally, MCDR additionality, the additional carbon going into the ocean because of some engineered solution, ideally, it would be referenced to a baseline. But this image here should give you an idea of how far we are from having uh, a baseline, even at one by one degree resolution, which, of course, swamps the scale of any proposed MCDR CDR yet, um, uh, how far we are from having some sort of a baseline at the scale of an MCDR project. Um, so that's sort of one component of the MCDR. The other component of the MCDR is that um, the magnitude of the ocean sink will for, for a very, very long time dominate over MCDR activities. Um, and again, the more we constrain our, our, our knowledge of the ocean carbon sink, the more we have the opportunity to potentially see the effect of MCDR against that baseline. Shown here is the total spread again. And then I, uh, from a recent paper, um, the, sorry, the, um, the reference on that got lost on the slide from Powis et al, 23, they, they looked at just the total intentional CDR going on right now. And that's not, mostly that's on land, very little of marine so far. And that is three orders of magnitude smaller at the global scale than our uncertainty in the ocean carbon sink, right? So, <laughs> We are so far from seeing these effects at the, at the, in the atmosphere, um, and, but anything we do on better constraining the sinks is going to help us eventually to see that and understand whether it's really making a difference to climate, which is, of course, the idea of any of these CDR efforts is that you're actually making a difference to the climate. So my last slide is then a proposed decadal challenge here. The question is, how do diverse physical, chemical, and biological processes combine across scales to drive the ocean carbon cycle? We need to narrow our estimates of the annual integrated sink to within, I would say, at least plus or minus 0.1. And we need to better constrain our projections, especially on the natural component. And coming with this is getting things better at the, at the smaller spatial scales. And this really requires you know, a whole host of observations, models, and enabling tools and techniques. And I think there's many additional science questions of great interest to the US um, po um, population and scientific community. Um, such as MCDR, such as heat uptake and sea level, such as ecosystems and fisheries, and even including glacial and glacial mechanisms. So that's what I had to share with you, and I'd be happy to engage in the conversation. Thank you. Fantastic. Uh, what an insightful panel. Thank you all so much for your perspectives. Brad, I'm going to turn it over to you for uh, the next part of our, of our panel discussion. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Mona, and thank you, everyone. And uh, uh, Thank you, uh, Galen, for kind of, in my view, kind of offering a kind of uh, an integrative perspective on developing what Shuyi, you were offering as the need for a grand challenge 
because I think it's it's one of the kind of considerations we have on the table uh, to try to frame some 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 small number for the oceans community of grand challenges that NSF uh, could contribute to. So I'm going to open up to questions and uh, and kind of run through them. And uh, but I'm going to, to to start by basically asking uh, the the first three speakers to kind of consider Galen's grand challenge and ask Eric and Shuyi and Sarah if if that fits within your kind of view where the you know the interest that you presented kind of would would intersect to contribute to to a grand challenge in the carbon space or whether there there could be separate grand challenges here so maybe eric to you and sarah and then we'll go around for questions eric do you want to give uh, a shot just thanking <laughs> <laughs> kind of work that I've been focusing on is very short scale, so it's a little bit less relevant, but it's more linked to... Uh, I can't hear you, Eric. So, you sound very far away. Okay, can you, can you hear me better this way? Yeah, that's better. Okay. So, I mean, since um, what I emphasized was more short-term, uh, mm -hmm still trying to deal with you know, how to link. But we do it you know, just how high resolution and uh, fine scale air sea interaction affects the uh, carbon intake, I think would be very relevant here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Should you uh, yeah, I think I want to sort of add to a lot of things that have been discussed, but wrap around um, the physical process itself. That's multi-scale, but how fundamentally air and ocean, atmosphere ocean exchange, including the gas phases, right? So in the last several decades, we build a lot of uh, uh, tools and model. I do a lot of modeling work as well. So we find a lot of these gas exchange uh, actually build it into the air sea interface with waves, ocean surface waves that inject mm -hmm. sea spray and a whole lot of process. And those are driven by a lot of these very large single dynamics field. So each time these exchange changes were due to say boundary layer stability and the stability stable boundary layer versus not stable boundary layer. There's a whole lot of things change fundamentally how you get things from the ocean to the atmosphere. Atmosphere to the ocean is not just at the interface. You get a lot more to it. I think we'll learn more, but I definitely thinking that actually the multi-scale aspects doesn't just apply the weather climate we talk, but the climate change itself, including the gas exchange, um, that has a lot to do with what we do understand in terms of physical process. Our model needs that. We need to observe this as much as we can. Hopefully this would put it into this grand challenge back again. Mm -hmm. Sarah, your thought? Yeah, I, I think I completely agree with what Eric and Shui have, have just said. Um, when we think about um, heat uptake by the ocean, for example, it, it seems to be really driven by transient processes that are probably, we might hypothesize, are equally likely to be driving gas exchange. Uh, this is stuff that's mediated by bubbles and storms and very short-lived events. And I don't think we have um, the observations to even understand what matters. And so there's a real opportunity to um, build, a um, to carry out major experiments just to understand the mechanisms. And to, I think what Galen emphasized, the importance of finding a way to to actually constrain and monitor this is sort of a good end goal. Um, it applies to carbon, but it also applies to making sure we understand heat and freshwater budgets in the ocean and how everything fits together. Yeah, thank, thanks for that. I have three or four hands up. So start with Tuba. 
Right. Thank you. Thank you to the four of you. I think you you really hit these presentations just at the right level. I really appreciate it. I have one really quick clarifying question and then a broader question. The clarifying question, it goes to Galen. Galen, you talked about intentional CDR in your very last slide. Tell me about what, what, what kinds of intentional CDR you're talking about. Like, Give me some examples. Yeah, so this is uh, a summary paper from Powis et al. It's in the reference slides. Um, and they're just adding up everything in the carbon registries um, and trying to make an estimate of what the intentional CAR going on now is. Mostly it's land, mostly it's, okay. you know, someone when you buy those credits on Delta for $5 a month yeah. or whatever it is, right? To, okay. That's yeah. the kind of thing that's being added up. And I don't have a good idea of how accurate that is. It's just the Got most it. recent okay. reference I found. Okay, that's great. Okay, then I have a broader question. So as part of our work in this committee, we've really been looking at, you know, ocean sciences very broadly. Um, and as part of that, you all might have read our interim report, we looked at things like ocean drilling and, and really more broadly, maybe paleoclimate, right? Um, you know, marine geology for the purposes of sort of reconstructing um, what, the, what, what the past climates of the earth were. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about how that impacts you all's work? Um, if you use data that comes from paleoclimate studies or insights, you know, if um, whether or not that's a critical piece in what it is that you all are doing and, and, and whether or not that helps in reducing uncertainties or is there any, are you interacting with that community at all? Yeah, I could take a, a stab at that. You know, I, I, I... I don't directly use that information given the time scales of what I'm interested in. But I do think that there's great potential. I mean, if we could get our models to give us a good mean state for today and give us, and we had constraints on the biological pump to really understand how it works and how it relates to the ocean circulation, then we have, would have the potential to use those models in the past. I mean, and people are already doing this, but we could do it with greater certainty to understand how a glacial and glacial change caused uh, you know, a reemergence of lots of carbon from the deep ocean, right? I mean, but I do think that my own personal work is a little far from actually doing that, but I see those connections as, as a great potential. Um, but given our lack of process understanding about the, how the biological pump works now, our inability to do it consistently with um, satellite observations or in our numerical models, like I just think that that we're basically guessing, right? Uh, and and um, I think that that's, um, I mean, it's not a total guess, that's unfair, but like it's it's not sufficiently constrained by observations. Um, and so uh, I think that that would be a, a really important outgrowth. Um, and I definitely think from a carbon cycle perspective, the fact that we can't really tell the world why uh, the glacial and glacial changes occurred with great certainty is a limit on our the confidence people can have in our ability to predict what's going to happen in the future. So I do think that two go hand in hand. Okay, thank you for that. Thank you, then Allison. Thanks, Brad, and thanks to all of our speakers. Um, I think everyone mentioned the need to encourage NSF to work with other federal agencies in their modeling um, efforts. And as you ca can imagine, I think that can be a little bit of a, a sensitive topic. And so I was wondering if anyone wanted to speak to um, recommendations on how to broadly broach that within a report, or if you wanted to expand more on some of the examples you gave where um, cross-agency collaboration would be very beneficial. I know um, there were some bullet points at the end of each of your slides, but if anyone wanted to go into more detail, I would welcome that. Um, I can come in a little. I'll take a shot at that. Sorry, did I? Over go ahead. Okay, so <laughs> I think ASF has done this sort of a working with other agencies, but many decades ago, so this is a thing that ASF now drawn a little bit of dormant period of time, the last two to three decades, as pointed out by the director of ASF, right? There has been, they have done a lot of these. It just, I started my career during Togo Core, just out of graduate school in early nineties. And that is many countries, many agencies, ASF played a key role to that, actually dressing a very, 
Im uh, important question that time. How do we, can we predict climate, seasonal to short-term climate? That was a big thing, right? Toga talk about and so on, Nino La Nina. So in that sense, he left that to say, we can do big things. We just not structured right to do that big things now. So this is where I think this report could really help move NSF beyond its current stage, dress Earth system science as a whole, and the ocean covers three quarters of Earth. And it, you know, you really have to bring this to the full fold of things that, you know, not study ocean atmosphere separate. It was just still NSF. The point is the NSF funding structure from the 1950s to 60s, they haven't changed. GEO has not changed. So this really point to our urgency, our problem, urgency, climate, and actually have changed. The societal needs changed. NSF has not. Sarah, you would want to, Thank you. to comment on this as well? I, I think I just, you asked Allison about modeling, and I think my comments were also directed to observing strategies and different ways that different agencies handle observations. And um, there are real opportunities there that maybe NSF hasn't been doing a lot of this, but I think there's uh, this is not stepping on toes of other agencies. They have really different roles in how they do that. Galen, did you have your hand up to respond to this? Yeah, I just wanted to add that I think that in yeah. the at the investigator level, in terms of developing models, for example, MOM6, who's in a NOAA developed model that's now gone to NCAR, I think there's a lot of collaboration across people, uh, such as uh, using machine learning to improve parameterizations with M squared lines, uh, as well as the LEAP SDC and working both with NCAR and NOAA GFPL. I think there's just lots of examples of where we work together across the agencies. And I think NSF has demonstrated the capacity to collaborate on funding, such as with the recent uh, MCDR NOAA NOP um, uh, awards that were reviewed at NOAA, but then uh, the award that I got was through NSF. So I do think that there are good models out there and that that should continue. Um, and But I agree with Shuri that it would be really good to find better ways to break down the silos um, uh, and, uh, and make it not just part of some big program like carbon and water or SDC, but a more kind of common, this is just part of what we do is that we write proposals that both the physical oceanographers and the chemical oceanographers and the biological oceanographers can all get, and the atmospheric scientists can all get excited about. Yeah, thanks. Jim, I have you as next in this yeah, I had a, line here. I had a question, I guess, mainly for Galen, but um, others might want to jump in on this. It, um, uh, yeah, I'm trying to think how to properly phrase it, but um, uh, with respect to the carbon cycle, what's what's what kind of answer would we give if it's pointed out that well, NSF spent you know probably 100 million dollars or more in the 90s with JGOFs and and it's linked to some extent with WOS on carbon cycle issues. What what is are the new things that that would make a a large effort? Uh, more successful or, or much improved on what Jagoffs did? And I, I kind of think I can answer that question myself, but I'm curious to, to, to what you would say, Galen. I mean, I would say without Jagoffs and without the excellent effort of people who figure out how to build a calibrated system for measuring DIC, we would still have a missing carbon sink, right? The only reason we know the closure is because of these hydrographic estimates, right? But I don't think that's good enough for the current policy environment, right? If all we wanted to do was just close that sink and sort of understand how things were evolving, that might be sufficient, right? To have this plus or minus 0.5 or 0.7 uncertainty. But if we really want to inform the world of how carbon is evolving, like we need to move into a different world where we have a level of understanding of the carbon cycle, the way we have an understanding of the weather right now, right? If we want to be able to say, yes, those Yes, your MCDR, your growing of kelp and sinking it made a difference. And we're going to have some way to know that. We have to do more, right? It, it, it's coming from the user requirements. Um, I think there's a lot of great science in there, um, but I think it, it is driven by this need to understand how the world is going to respond to climate change, both in support of mitigation and in the underlying response of all these critical things. Um, and I think the MCDR um, 
raises just a whole nother set of, of questions about the scale at which we need to constrain these processes. Uh, that's very different than we had even five years ago. Um, that's my personal opinion. Um, I just one quick comment about the interaction between agencies. I, as a program officer, I in the '90s, um, and a, actually in the '80s, there was there was, seemed to be a lot of interaction between the head of geoscience at NSF, uh, Mike Hall's climate program at NOAA, and um, uh, the program that um, what was it the um, uh, that Shelby Tilford ran at NASA headquarters for, in. in uh, Earth system science. They, they seem to be meeting regularly. There was a lot of talk about interaction. And, and as a division director in the early 2000s, I didn't see that at all um, at, when I was at Ocean Sciences. And, and so it's sort, sort of like the breakdown of just communicating between the agency heads to try to get the, the, the key, not, not necessarily the heads of the agencies, but the heads of the key brand, key directorates, I think is really missing. And that, that might really be a big impediment to trying to get a you know big multi-agency programs rolling again. Sorry, Ajit, I'd muted myself. <laughs> Thanks, Jim. Oh, thanks, Jim. Um, that's a good point, Jim, and the other agency that was also active in this is ONR, but in any case. Um, the question is, I guess, directed a little bit at Eric, but then it, all of you had similar scales in your uh, presentation, so I am curious uh, to understand how critical you think it is that you need to build up from the small scale. Um, Eric, you made a really good case for where the small scales could make a difference. Um, and yet a lot of the questions that we are dealing with right now are at the large scale. And I just wonder um, your sense about how you're building up, how good we are at the large scale models without understanding the small scales. So, I mean, you know, there are a lot of processes that are not resolved by the current models that need to be taken into account. And I gave some examples uh, to that extent. As we, there's more and more conver convergence between um, what I call the operational models and the climate models. You have more and more coupled ocean atmosphere being run on the order of tens of degree. But what I'm trying to emphasize is that we go to the next step. I mean, one tenth of a degree, which is eddy resolving for the ocean, was a threshold. Uh, but there is another uh, breakthrough is by resolving sub mesoscale features that feed on the larger scale that need to be uh, understood. And if you want to make any further progress in realistic you know, being more realistic, um, you need to really push your resolution and put the effort on it. But it is very time consuming, as well as the community needs to be, you need the expertise to be able to do that. And uh, they are becoming so big, those numeric models, that you really need to think about how to analyze them and how to extract uh, useful information out of them. Um, can I you? add a point? Yeah, yeah, go yeah. ahead. Yeah. So, in fact, the scale in terms of small scale versus large scale, um, we tend to think sometimes is that a, the large scale downscaling to a small scale. So in that sense, there is no feedback. Um, the small scale doesn't upscaling. So the example I gave you on the uh, ENSO prediction, so the precipitation rainfall, it's on the mesoscale daily time scale, but they accumulate into a very large scale. And after rain so much in the Central Pacific left this big pool of fresh water drives, the density current is much larger scale now, right? They last much longer. They feed right back to the so they onside with that. So if the model can't really get that process in the small scale right, then the next scale is not going to feel it at all. So this two-way interaction of these very high frequency things to, we just recently began to realize because our model got better, 
In fact, the original discovery is recent thing using HICOM with fully coupled wharf. We realize that process can upscaling. So this is where I would say, if we're thinking multi-scale, it's sort of a two-way street. And without these processes getting right, the next scale may not be hopeful to get it right. Yeah, thank, thanks for that. Galen, let's see here. I just, I just wanted to add that I completely agree with what Erica and Sheree have said about this scale up, right? The, the biology is up, uh, obviously happening at these smaller scales as well, and the carbon fluxes as well. And so really in order to understand the um, how it scales up to the global scale carbon sink, we need to begin to understand what really happens in detail at these smaller scales. I think process studies with really high resolution models coupled to that, so that then we can begin to extract the relevant information that might go into a course or model for longer term integrations all the way to glacial or glacial time scales. But we haven't done that yet. And, and, and we don't have the observations to do a great job of constraining it. And, and I think that um, uh, we're still, that is still a frontier. And I think that would be a, um, a really good way also to pull together all of the different parts of OCE to, um, to motivate for something bigger, right? Not Let's not fight over the crumbs here. Let's work together and do something big. Great. Yeah, I think that's where we're, we're trying to, to frame that so that that's an addressable question as opposed to just an aspiration, which I think we all have. Uh, Rick. Yeah, thank you. So, um... One one comment to Jim and then one question for people. Jim, I think your observation about the old older days earlier about NSF collaborating is actually true. Uh, even in the late 20 teens when I was there, saw the same thing. It took a Herculean amount of work for Paula and I just to get exports off the ground. And that was tiny compared to some of these other things. I think it's due to when you get into a dwindling resource environment, then it's natural for um, you know, one of the earlier casualties in that to have these expansive interdisciplinary interagency programs because everybody's really busy just minding the store of their own agency. <clears throat> it's just my own theory. Question to the panelists, um, literally all of them, although uh, Shui, Sarah, um, and uh, Galen mentioned NSF in particular. Um, I haven't heard a lot about TIP today. And I'm interested in if you folks, Eric, you as well, of course, um, feel that in the climate science sector, uh, anything about TIP? You guys get up in the morning saying, hey, let's see what TIP has to offer. Is TIP making a difference. <laughs> um, you know, can't wait to go to the TIP website and see what else is going to be coming down the pike not in the commercialization or maybe they're developing sensors or what have you that might eventually be helpful. But I mean specifically in terms of helping us constrain um, climate change boundaries or modeling or what have you. I don't think, maybe I missed it, but I didn't hear tip today and I mm -hmm. wonder why. So who wants to wave the tip flag first? I'll, I'll, I'll say yeah. a few things about tip. Oh, um, oh, sure. So Sorry. geo directory gave us a briefing three years ago when they sort of worked with punch on tip. So one thing came as a UCAR board, we are asking the tip using climate as motivation, but the geo is not part of a tip. So that was really eye-opening at the time. And it turned out it hasn't improved that much. Um, TIP is a great idea, I have to say. It's very innovative in its core, but how to put climate in there. All the engineer people try to address climate, but geo is not at the table. So this is what largely kind of a still, we just ask a punch one more time about how do you actually reactive geo to in kind of integrate geo into TIP's idea. So we have fundamental role to play in terms of put fundamental science, innovative science into TIP. So one last thing about TIP, TIP has called a few large 150 million type initiative. They actually didn't select because some of the things actually 
too small to fit. So that was kind of all of eye opener too, is that it, you know the community hasn't got used to this idea. Work together, we can do something big. Grant. Um, this is where I would leave that. I hope you guys have influence on in ASF. Really help them to understand this problem. <laughs> that community need this grand idea, but also we need organizing into something better. Thank you, Shiyu. Thank you. Yeah. Kayla? Uh, Kayla? I was just gonna say, you know, that if you kick a hundred dollar a ton estimate of the value of CO2, the ocean sink value is $250 billion a year, right? And it's mitigation of climate, right? So, but no one is paying that. No one is is investing to cover $250 billion a year, right? But if they were, then we would be in immediately uh, a, a, you know, applicable to TIP, right? Uh, how do we get that? So MCR may be taking us in that direction. I think it would be worth trying if, you know, the numbers that get thrown around about MCDR, um, uh, and, and the potential for commercialization. But I mean, we just have a fundamental challenge. The ocean is this background thing that no one's paying for, it's an externality. And so how do we connect to something like TIP that, that I don't understand everything about it, That is, uh, but it's essentially about how do we commercialize ideas? I mean, how do we break that ba barrier? Thanks, Galen. So I know we're, we're nearing the end of our, our... Q&A here, but we have a little more time. So, Maya? I have just a very quick nuts and bolts question. Shui, you uh, gave a very compelling case about the small scale being important if, if you're going to do things at a larger scale. Um, does that mean that you need that the really high resolution measurements everywhere, or can you understand the small scale processes in a few places enough to inform your larger scale modeling or is it so critical that you're never going to understand or be able to forecast accurately in the system if you don't have fine scale measurements everywhere excellent question so um i think early on when navy came uh, to us about a sea blast so they said if money is not a problem Think of something big. And that was the time that the fancy go process is really surfaced. So we realized that, right? So I don't think we're living in the world the money is not a problem. So it is a continual constraint, right? So I do think the small scale process can be understood by target fuel campaigns. If we recognize the key region like the Central Pacific right now, it's given so much at stake about ENSO predictions and so on, right? But do we need that to be able to do, you know, like a daily thing that has to be monitored? I don't think so. I think we use these process, the goal is to build our models, right? But then at the same time, we do want a certain monitor system that able to give you the large scale uh, things to guide where the the high resolution process is then with the target observations, but model is much, much better than 30 years ago. I think the hope is that, yes, the small scale process measure, get them into the model. If model can do better, we all better off. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Tuba. Thank you. I appreciate that I get to ask a second question. Um, and I wanted to comment on something, Shui, that you brought up twice, which uh, relates to sort of like, it, are we as a community thinking big enough, you know, your conversations with Ponch and the examples you gave from the past, you know, exploring the poles, Antarctica, that kind of thing. Many of those um, very large programs, though, were motivated by political issues. They were motivated by political tensions. Um, and so I think that's a that's a that's another point to think about here, um, you know, because I think, you know, just bottom up, big ideas may or may not um, find traction with um, it within the current structure. So that, that's just something I wanted to throw out there. Uh, and I don't know if we need to think, talk about it more. I also see Galen's hand up. So yeah, Galen's I mean, got her hand up. <laughs> yeah, I'll just say, I think if, if the neutrino business can, uh, can make the case that we need to build Ice Cube at the South Pole, we should be able to make the case that we need to do this work in order to understand climate and climate change. We just have to come together. I mean, the physicists are requesting what, one and a half billion dollars for ground-based telescopes, two of them, right? I mean, that is important, yes, but this, 
let's make the case jointly that this is more important uh, and that, you know, that's what we need to do. We need to come together for these topics. We need to, to we need not to fight over the crumbs and we need to, um, yeah, make the case. And I, yeah, politics matters, but I think the politics of, of climate and the worry about climate are very real and we can, um, uh, we need to do more. Uh, it's, it's urgent and we need to make that case. So, yeah. Thank you, Galen, I, I love that. Thank you. Yeah, I agree. I, I do want to add a little bit of it to this thing is that, in fact, a lot of these large programs, including Ozone, all driven by a very important science question as well as a societal needs, right? So climate change is societal needs by far now. It's so urgent. So climate extreme right now, we're all influenced. You guys probably some of you in the heat waves and right now, right? So this is a piece that community need advocate that strongly that we are at that time now that we really needs to move, make a bigger sense. So I, I, I think this. Thank you for that too, because I think this is a is a really good kind of global scale perspective on, on you know the wider climate issue, but also kind of this the, the need for this committee to kind of frame a, a set of questions that pose grand challenges that that aren't just abstract, but are seen as societally relevant. So I think that's that's our kind of uh, collective challenge here. And unless there are any kind of burning final points or questions, then I'll suggest we've kind of finished this session. Thank Mona, thank all the speakers, uh, all your contributions. We really appreciate uh, your input and we'll be kind of working with uh, the comments you've made and also the uh, the presentations that you've given for you know that some of the details there we can can work from and uh, we hope you will and we hope we all will be satisfied with the outcome of what we you know this 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 discussion yields both today and and by the end of the year and then I think I'm just passing this back to Kelly or are we just closing this yeah, session? Thank you so I'm much. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Am I double muted? Okay. Yep. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you so much um, to Brad and Mona and to our panelists. Um, you all stayed on time and you gave us exactly the information that we asked for. <laughs> so, so thank you. There is so much useful information in this past hour and a half. Um, if you haven't already sent us a copy of your presentation, please do, because I, I imagine we will be referring to it. Um, as we move forward. So lot, lots of great stuff. Thank you so much. Um, we really appreciate it. Um, and then for, for the committee members, we will go into closed session for 30 minutes um, just to try and help prepare for our next meeting. So thank you so much and have a great rest of your day.